evening, I'm an actor telling Amira's story. I met Amira last month and this is her story in her own words. When I look back at what happened to me, it's hard to believe that this was me, that this was my life. It all seems so unbelievable now. In my culture, arranged marriage happens a lot. My sister was promised to a school teacher from the UK. Ahmed was 23 years old. He flew over to India with his father. His father decided that Ahmed shouldn't marry my sister, who was the same age as him, but should marry me. I was 13. My mother wasn't happy at all, but my parents were persuaded. I was married near my home and then went over to the UK. My father-in-law obtained a fake passport telling a fake age. It was like my whole world had disappeared when I came to England. Everything was so different, and everything familiar to me had disappeared. The whole family were controlling me. I lived with my father-in-law, his mother, and my husband, Ahmed. The whole family treated me like a servant, and I was beaten and controlled. I no longer had any choices about what I wore, what I ate. I could only wear traditional clothes that were chosen for me. I was discouraged from making friends, and I was told that it was dangerous outside, so I never went out by myself. My husband taught me English so I could pass my life in the UK test. I was such a child, I was so innocent. I had had no sexual education in India, so my husband made me watch porn with him to understand about sex. I didn't know about intimacy, all I knew about was degrading. My husband never showed me love or affection. He never bought me a birthday present or made me feel appreciated. I felt so alone. I had my beautiful son Majid when I was 17. He was the light of my life. I wanted a different life for Majid. I didn't want my son to be like them. And I wanted him to be kind and caring. But the family encouraged Majid to treat me like a servant too. They taught him to pull my hair and not listen to me. I knew things had to change and I was so tired of being controlled. One day I was sad with my father and he saw my husband beating me so he sent relatives to come and get me. When they came, my husband left with my son. I had never spent a moment away from him, my two-year-old, and I couldn't imagine how he'd be feeling. I was so worried about him. Despite the police advising me to leave, they didn't advise me about parental responsibility. I had to go to court to get my son back, even though my husband was considered a paedophile and violent. I had to employ lawyers privately, as accessing legal aid would have taken months. I went to a women's refuge where they held me. I had £50 a week in the refuge. We had no clothes, not even a coat for my son. We had to pay service charges, and have money for laundry. I had no buggy, so it was difficult to go shopping. He caused a chill one day when we were out shopping as he had no coat and I felt so sad that I couldn't provide for my son. I had never been to that part of London before and I didn't know where anything was. I wasn't entitled to benefits as I was illegal. I went through a very long court case at Crown Court with my ex-husband who claimed to be unaware that I was so young. He now no longer teaches and cannot see our son. I left the hostel and was moved to another part of London. Then I went up to the northwest. I was welcomed by community in my current home. I used to go to church groups and learn to crochet with some older ladies. People were very kind, but with no documents I couldn't access benefits and I couldn't work. Eventually, people from community groups and the church helped me. I had some charity donations and could access some benefits. However, when my son was five, my income changed to JSA. I received £80 a week in benefits. My rent is £100 a week. So it is hard to keep my home and provide for my son, which means I'm not able to pay my rent. Being in poverty makes me feel ashamed. When I had to go to food bank, I came home and broke down in tears. Having to get a food bank parcel made me feel like a failure. Today I feel so miserable, so silent inside. I just want to run from the world and hide. My heart like the Titanic, it's about to subside. And by the end of the day, guaranteed I'll have cried. You all think I'm happy, feeling strong, I lied. Another piece of my heart just died. To let anyone in again, it's access denied. 
Sorry, I just need to hang on to that last little bit of pride. Oh, and that I have to abide. Otherwise, I'll end up fried and then chucked out into the tide. At this moment, I don't care about my guide as my guide won't hack my version of a scary ride. I don't have organised, I have confusing strides, yet that alone will stop me being a bride. My heart will always be open wide, come on, let's send it, give me a cup of peroxide. Honestly, what's the point in anything? I forgot what it's like to have a genuine grin. I'm just the one that was saved when beyond repair, never the same, should have been chucked in the bin. My mum wanted me, she was my next of kin. I say, come on, pray for forgiveness, you committed a sin. You should have buried me in a small sized coffin tin. Got yourself drunk on a bottle of gin. To be accepted for me would just be a win. I've been punished to earth to be the emotional slave. I must have been bad in my last life, punished to this on an early grave. Whoever is persistent with me must be brave. I'd be happy to start again in a new life, but I'd give a wave. As I've been punished enough, I've learned my lesson, I've had it rough. I'm a soul this week, no longer tough. Come on, pick on someone else now, I've had enough. My creator replies, that's your tough look. Turn to a new page and start a new book. As what's written so far, no one gives a fuck. Uh, this short poem was written by another community inspirer who can't be here today and has asked me to read it on her behalf. So this is Mandy. Feeding myself with a bag of sugar, looking for food there was no other. The hole in my stomach is an ache in the pit. I have no money, I can't help it. I'm rummaging through bins for butties, burgers and rusty tins. There's nothing to keep me from poverty now. I feel a dirty, helpless cow. Bones are being mentioned in there. Come down still on the sea. My name is Sharon Mayer, um, I'm a farmer, um, 11 years ago we had to sell our cows because we weren't making enough money and I now work as an agricultural chaplain covering the whole of Cheshire and the Wirral. I visited many farms in the last eight years, some pleasant well maintained farmsteads Others seem to be in another era. It is those at the harbour end of farming, finding it increasingly difficult to make a living from the land that I represent today. Rural poverty? What's that all about? Surely poverty is restricted to urbanised areas. The countryside is such an idyllic place to be. Fresh air, space, beautiful views, Surely this is the province of the well-to-do, or is it? Whilst true for many who live in rural areas, the reality can be very different for those who traditionally make their living from the land. I was born in the late 70s in Ellesmere Port. My dad worked in Bogwater's paper factory, while my mother was at home with me, my brother and my sister. Times were hard, they got much harder after my dad was made redundant. The 90s were much better when my dad became a plasterer and my mum went to college and studied and became an occupational therapist. The 90s were really good for me too. I always had the paper around and then at 15 I worked as a glass collector at sports and social club. I felt pretty rich having £2.50 an hour wage at 15. After leaving school at 16 I started a youth training apprenticeship as a plumber. Unfortunately, this only lasted a year, 
I used to have to leave Nestor at 7 in the morning for Bidston, wait 45 minutes for the next train to Birkenhead, then change for Liverpool, then change again for Riversdale. After that, I'd have to walk around a mile to get to my university course, often arriving after our start time. To get home, I needed to leave early to get the last train back home, which I'd often miss. So being late and getting in early meant I was always in trouble with the teachers. Eventually, I had to leave the job because the public transport night work was costing me over a quarter of my weekly wage and I couldn't survive on such a low income. I did a few different jobs for the next couple of years, and then at 19 I got a well-paid job in a local factory. Six pounds an hour in the 90s for a lad living at home with his parents was pretty good. I moved out, I lived with some friends, I passed my motorcycle, accident, uh, motorcycle license, bought a motorcycle, and I went on holidays. Then I had a serious motorcycle accident. I could no longer do my job as it was very physical. Luckily, I got a job working in the lab with quality control. I had learned new science skills and suffered a large pay decrease. I moved back to live with my parents and after a couple of years, received compensation payout for my accident. I invested more, the money into buying a house. Back then, the house prices were starting to increase rapidly. The large company I worked for moved from my hometown and to get there was very difficult as the public transport was awful and then I got made redundant. After this happened I had to claim benefits for the very first time. It was horrible, I felt demeaning having to sign on, I hated the stigma and the way I was treated by the staff. After a few months I got a job in a printer's and I worked my way up and became a machine operator where I was on a good wage until the 2008 crash. First we had a 10% pay cut, and then all the overtime rates stopped, and then we lost 25% of our hours each week. And this was the deal for people who were still employed. Soon the inevitable came, my redundancy. Since then, I've been on and off benefits, working for agencies, self-employed as a plasterer, some healthcare work, but I've never been paid enough to get by on. Whilst living on benefits, I cannot afford to heat my home or eat properly. So I keep chickens and I grow my own food. I often have to choose between heating my house for a short amount of time or buying food. Washing clothes is expensive too, and so is buying them. Even socks these days are very expensive when you don't have any money. Now I work in three voluntary roles gaining new skills I can use for the first time and doing work in which I love. I even managed to win a Royal Horticultural Thriving Community Garden Award at Neston Community Centre with a small team of like-minded people. I'd love to get work with paid work in conservation, but I don't have any money to get paid for training to get a paid job. I'm stuck in a catch-22 situation where if I sold my house, I may have a small amount of money left to pay for my courses, but then I would be homeless. Or I could keep my house, which I can't afford to heat or even repair, but at least I have a roof over my head. While well, I do my voluntary work, because there are no jobs. I'm in poverty due to low wages, not enough jobs, untrustworthy transport, lack of academic skills, Despite that, I don't consider myself a poor person. I am rich in life, but I have no money. I'd like to thank you all for listening so intently to our stories today, and I'd like you to welcome all our community inspirers to take the stage.
evidence, we've had very little time to prepare. And I think we're just here to um, pass on the messages that we've just had a discussion as the um, team of influencers and decision makers. I think the message that came across most of all that we would all like to say a massive thank you to the community inspirers and how we are all in awe of their courage and bravery to stand up in front of us today and most of us were on the verge of tears this morning. So can we just have a round of applause again? Thank you. Um, I think one of the other things that came out this morning was um, how quickly the community inspires. Thank you. The community inspires have come together as a team. And we hope, civic and business leaders, that we can do the same, that we can come together as a team and work together with the community inspirers. We said it's a gift that we've been given, that we can all work together to try and fashion some change and make sure that things are different in the future. So once again, thank you. We've got a long road ahead of us and let's hope that we can all work together and make a difference in Cheshire West and Chester. The idea behind your lunch today is quite symbolic. Most of you are aware of the food bank and the amazing service that they provide to help those in poverty. But the truth is they shouldn't need to exist. Nobody should be going hungry in this day and age. Your lunch today will be a basic meal, which is made only from ingredients you would find in a food bank parcel. So there will be no, um, you'll notice no extras such as fresh vegetables or bread. To get your lunch, you will need to complete a red food bank voucher at your table. These will be handed out shortly by Carla and Chris, Chrissy, two of our community inspirers. Instructions for use are on the voucher. Please make sure you, f you complete it fully, making sure you answer all of the questions in order to receive your lunch. The idea behind giving you vouchers and the basic meal came from the community inspirers so that today the tables might be turned. For a lot of people, having to resort to charity to feed themselves and their family has been their lowest point, with the red voucher being an obvious <coughs> display of their poverty. Carla and Chrissy will now hand out your vouchers table by table. When completed, we'd like you to take it to the food bank station at the back and hand it to Cindy or Gary, our community inspirers, in order to collect your lunch which will be served at the back of the room. Thank you and enjoy.